Hey everyone, congratulations for making it all the way to Neptune One. I'm Dennis Nash. I'm one of the multiple PIs of the Central Africa Idea cohort. And I'm I'm here with a team of people that are working on this project who you'll you'll hear from. And 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 we're yeah, very pleased to be here today. We're highlighting for you here uh, what we're gonna do today. We actually have about, you know, a, a part one that is really focused on setting up the the group for, for a, setting things up for a group discussion, trying to get us oriented and on the same page about some some background material, climate change and HIV risk that Sherry Weiser is going to present. I'm going to talk about an overview of our new newly funded portfolio, really, of climate and HIV research in the IDEA network from, from NIH. And and then we're going to delve into a, what what is has been a really a little bit foreign for for many of us traditional clinical and epidemiologic and public health researchers, which is this climate data that we're leveraging to do this research. And and we have with us Frank Davenport, who who is a subject matter expert and very uniquely positioned to to work with us and to tell you all about these these data sets, and of course. The data on temperature and rainfall are important, but there's also other contextual and in, contextual information that is needed to to re really leverage these data and understand why things are impacting things the way they are or not in different settings. And a Andrew Morocco is here to to talk with us about that leveraging space other spatial data sets that are relevant to this kind of research. And, and then Ellen Brazier is going to talk about some of the methodological considerations. The, the main purpose of this, this work is to try and, and, and characterize the causal relationships between extreme weather and HIV outcomes. And so that, that's bringing up for us a number of methodological considerations, which, which Ellen has been at the center of think, thinking about these things. And she's going to share some of our latest thinking. And lastly, we're going to hear from Pam Murnain, who is going to talk about some of the ways that we're we're going to try to get at mechanisms and mediators and moderators of associations between extreme weather and HIV outcomes. So so that's sort of what what we have prepared. And after that, we're going to have coffee, and we're going to have plenty of time for discussion and hopefully you know reactions and thoughts and inputs around the the work that we're embarking on. I'll turn it over to you, Sherry. You Fabulous. actually have this oh, mic. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to get us started by really describing uh, some background and the pathways through which climate change negatively impacts HIV outcomes. And hopefully, uh, Carly, let us know online. I mean, I mean, uh, Rosemary, let us know online if you cannot hear us. Let us know. So, climate change. We're all here because climate change is unquestionably what we think is the biggest public health crisis of the 21st century. So just for some examples, we expect that there's going to be 200 million climate migrants by the year 2050. The number's probably even higher right now, which means that one out of every 45 people in the world will have been displaced by climate change. Currently, one in nine people in the world are hungry and climate change is exacerbating it. It's anticipated that um, this is gonna go up by over 50% by the year 2050. By 2070, we expect that about a third of the world's population will be living in dangerous extreme heat. And this is extreme heat that is not suitable to human thriving. And finally, climate change is decreasing global economic output. It's estimated uh, that it'll be decreased by 23 trillion by mid-century. So climate change drives significant health disparities among marginalized populations, such as low wealth communities, people of color, migrant populations and the elderly, and this is referred to as the climate gap. So these populations have contributed least to climate change, but suffer first and worst from the negative health impacts. So they have a higher likelihood of exposure to climate hazards due to racial, economic, and other injustices. For example, they're more likely to live in low wealth areas prone to extreme heat or um, to flooding. And they also um, really, because of their circumstances, have a lower ability to anticipate, cope with, and adapt to these impacts. And these two maps show just how glaring this climate gap could be. So on the bottom left, you can see that the countries with the highest per capita CO2 emissions, so the greatest consumers, like the US, Canada, and Russia, 
have some of the lowest mortality linked with climate change that you can see in the top right maps. Meanwhile, um, areas with the lowest per capita emissions, like Sub-Saharan Africa and South America, suffered the highest climate-related mortality rates. And now let me turn to the context of HIV AIDS. And it isn't surprising that these massive public health threats of our lifetime are linked, because, of course, climate change preferentially, as well as HIV, affect uh, those most vulnerable among us. So you can see in these maps that the regions of the world with the highest HIV prevalence shown in the top maps in the pink and purple colors strongly overlap with those most vulnerable to climate vulnerability as shown in the bottom map in the red and orange colors. And this is because some of the same effects of climate change that I've just gone over, like food insecurity and migration, could negatively impact uh, people living with HIV AIDS. And because of these intersecting phenomenon, Unfortunately, it's anticipated that climate change can really undermine some of the great progress we've made in the HIV epidemic over the past several decades. So here's a conceptual framework our team developed to understand the bi-directional links between climate change and HIV AIDS, and we've been testing this empirically in studies. So at the top, you can see global environmental change, so manifested by rising greenhouse gases and temperatures, rising sea levels, um, natural disasters and flooding, among other things. And these both affect risk of acquiring HIV and worse HIV health outcomes through the five pathways that you see listed here, which are water and food insecurity, migration and displacement, higher prevalence of infectious diseases, infrastructure erosion, and violence. And these pathways are also related to one another. So for instance, water and food insecurity, we know can affect, for instance, migration and displacement and gender-based violence. At the bottom, you can see that um, HIV-related morbidity and mortality then can contribute to decreased household resources and lower labor availability, which then feeds back to cause further depletion of natural resources through things like deforestation, land degradation and overfishing, which then creates this vicious cycle towards worse local ecologic harm. And um, I'm going to be using this framework to talk through some research findings. So starting with water and food insecurity, climate change is a very important driver of water and food insecurity worldwide. And there's a separate, quite growing body of literature showing that water and food insecurity worsen HIV acquisition risk as well as health outcomes. So starting with water, currently one in three people globally lack access to safe drinking water, and over half of the world's population does not have access to safe sanitation. Sanitation and climate change is exacerbating this problem. So in these maps, you can see here that the deeper blue spots are those regions with rapidly increasing amounts of water, and the deeper red spots are those regions with rapidly decreasing amounts of water. And both of these, we know, cause water insecurity and pose major threats to human health. So for example, drought can lead to both malnutrition and dehydration, which then can impair immune responses and increase susceptibility to infections. Flooding, we know, can contribute to waterborne infections and direct injury and death. And in our own research, we have found that among people living with HIV, water insecurity is associated with incomplete viral suppression, having an AIDS-defining illness, as well as poor health-related quality of life. And here's an example of how a not too little water could negatively impact uh, HIV AIDS. So there's a number of studies that consistently show an association with between drought conditions and HIV prevalence. So one um, older study um, that used a data from about 19 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, this was demographic and health survey data, found that each year of experiencing drought was associated with an 11% increase in HIV AIDS prevalence. And in our research, and Dennis and I looked at the converse, and we found that each year of experiencing extreme precipitation in 20, this was a data set of 23 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, was associated with 14% higher odds of having HIV and an 11% higher odds of having another sexually transmitted disease. Now, turning to food insecurity, we know that the regions of the world that have the highest prevalence of hunger, so Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, and Southeast Asia, also are most vulnerable to climate threats. And you can see this by the red and orange colors that represent both high hunger and climate vulnerability. 
And climate change negatively impacts all aspects of food insecurity. So it affects food availability because drought, high temperatures, and heavy rains we know can contribute to crop loss, animal death, and migration of fish. We also see reduced food access through the economic aspects of climate change like income loss and unemployment. We see reduced food utilization or the inability to consume a nutritious diet through um, reduced diet quality and also food and water contamination. And finally, the stability of the entire food system can be compromised by things like market volatility and rising food prices, as well as political instability and conflict. And then in turn, food insecurity is associated with a range of poor health outcomes, very important for HIV. So for instance, we and others have shown that food insecurity is associated with worse HIV outcomes along the entire cascade of care. So from higher acquisition risk to incomplete viral suppression to higher morbidity and mortality. It's also associated with other STDs and with higher mortality from Ebola virus disease. Importantly, it's associated with HIV-associated comorbidities. So food insecurity is associated with more diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and with neuro, you know, with neurocognitive issues and mental health issues like cognitive decline, anxiety, and depression. So now turning to impacts on nutrition, we know that higher CO2 levels, for instance, have been found in studies to contribute to a 3 to 17% decline in the amount of protein, iron, and zinc in critical crops like wheat and rice. And the figure at the bottom shows the risk of deficient intake of these nutrients and the atmospheric CO2 levels predicted for the year 1950 with the red and orange colors being the highest risk areas. So climate change is also driving a rapid decline in the population of pollinators around the world. And importantly, a lot of our nutrients globally come from pollinated crops like fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Finally, about 1 billion people in the world rely on fish catch for their diet, but unfortunately, um, climate change is affecting this. Um, so since 1996, fish catch has been falling, and this puts people at risk of zinc, iron, and vitamin A deficiencies. So as another example of how climate change affects nutrition, in a meta-analysis, we found that drought conditions were associated with about 46% higher odds of wasting and underweight prevalence in adjusted analyses. And in a prediction model, we estimated that climate change will increase the prevalence of malnutrition by greater than 50% by the year 2050. So the quotes on the right-hand side are from a qualitative study in Kenya, where participants really talked about how loss of crops, animals, and income from drought and flooding affected their diet quality and also contributed to weight loss and stunting in their children. And I'm just going to read you the top quote from a female participant. Weather changes affects yields on my farm. Too much rain or drought interfere with the growth of plants and lowers the quality of yields. This interferes with our children's growth since they are forced to eat food that are difficult to chew. And then these climate-driven changes in our diet can also alter our gut microbiome and contribute to impaired immune responses, inflammation, um, and immune activation, which then increases risk of both infectious and non-communicable diseases. So moving to the migration pathway, as I mentioned earlier, climate change is driving one of the largest mass migrations in human history. This has many negative consequences for health and well-being, and specifically in the context of HIV, we know that migration leads to HIV acquisition risk and worse outcomes. So climate change can influence migration directly, such as when you find forced displacements from sea level rise, floods, and hurricanes, but then also indirectly by really amplifying those socio-political and economic drivers of migration. So for example, crop failures due to drought can drive food and water insecurity, which then really can increase pressure on affected populations to migrate. As you can see in the figure, mobility patterns include moving away from climate affected regions. So for instance, when people move from rural to urban areas or from coastal areas inland, but people could also move into regions of climate risk. And this is actually quite, a, is more common because this occurs when people are living in regions particularly susceptible to climate change. And finally, it's those immobile populations that may fare the worst in terms of their climate health risks due to their inability to migrate. And there are significant health consequences of forced migration from climate change. So just um, as an example, we know that um, 
for instance, uh, populations that are mi that migrate have a higher sexual network, have a larger sexual network, more exposure to gender-based violence, which will then potentiate HIV and STI transmission. We know that infectious disease outbreaks are really common in crowded refugee camps and settlements. And then disruptions in people's social network and livelihoods can then put people at risk for malnutrition and poor mental health, very relevant for people with HIV. So our work has shown that there may be gender differences in climate-related migration. For example, in our recent analysis, we used DHS data from 23 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and found that women had higher odds of migration, as you can see, in both conditions of drought and excessive rains, while we didn't find the same associations for men. And this does have important public health consequences because female migrants uh, face unique health challenges, such as exposure to gender-based violence and issues with reproductive health. And on the right-hand side is a quote from the qualitative study that I went over earlier in Kenya, and floods were viewed as a really important contributor to migration due to destroyed crops, homes, and infrastructure. And I'll read this quote. Floods have increased because you find when it rained less, places like Modi were so affected to an extent that those who lived there were forced to relocate to other places. There were some homes that were destroyed completely. So turning to infectious disease, we know that climate change can directly increase the incidence of a host of infectious diseases, particularly vector-borne and waterborne diseases. And this has very important implications for people living with HIV, where you know, malaria and diarrheal illnesses and other infections increase morbidity. So just for some examples, we know that mosquito species are very sensitive to changing temperatures. And so, for example, in the case of malaria, Anopheles mosquito development does not occur above or below certain temperature thresholds. So what this means is that malaria incidence is going to go down in certain regions that get too hot. So that sounds good. But then it's also going to go up in new regions that um, where, where the temperature becomes this just right. This is going to lead to overall increased morbidity and mortality because it's going to move into regions that don't have existing uh, public health infrastructure for malaria or immunity. So an estimated 75% of emerging infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic, and these are also influenced by climate change. So rising precipitation and temperature shifts, combined with human actions like deforestation and urbanization, can really shift the geographic range and population density of animal vectors, and then move them closer to humans and their livestock, which then creates this perfect opportunity for viral spillover. And then these conditions can also increase pathogen transmission by heightening physiologic stress in animals, which thereby reduces their immunity and heightens pathogen loads. And because of all of these things, it's projected that we're entering a new uh, you know, rise in global pandemics for the foreseeable future related to climate change. So as an example of how drought can, af can affect infectious diseases, using Uganda National Panel Survey data, our team found that as precipitation increased, you can see self-reported diarrhea, cough, and fever among children decreased, but you can also see that this leveled off and started increasing again at the highest levels of rainfall. Turning back to our qualitative data, um, HIV-infected participants in Kenya described what they perceived as increased opportunistic infections from cold and wet living conditions, more diarrhea outbreaks from contaminated floodwaters, an increased incidence of malaria from standing floodwaters, and all of these contributed to worse HIV health. And here's a quote from a female participant. Even though we rarely face chronic diseases, malaria and flu were common during this recent rainy season. Malaria is more common now due to stagnant pools of water that breed mosquitoes during rains. As another pathway, infrastructure erosion from flooding and other extreme weather events can make it very difficult for people to get to clinic, take their medications, which has very important impacts for people living with HIV. So for example, and this really did play out in our qualitative study where participants noted that flooding prevented them from getting to clinic and to their pharmacies. And here's a quote from a male participant. When it rains, reaching such places is a challenge since the roads become muddy and impassable. Reaching Minyanya Clinic is a hustle because the roads are in deplorable condition. The fare is hiked by motorcycle operators. It is very hard to find any means of transport. 
And so another example of how climate change could affect HIV-associated health behaviors through these pathways, um, we used DHS data from 11 uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa to look at association between drought in the previous year and self-reported HIV testing. And we found that drought was associated with lower odds of testing among both rural and adolescent populations. And we hypothesized that these populations may be more vulnerable to both income shocks and food shortages resulting from drought, which then really could um, decrease their access to medical care. And as another example of how drought can affect health behaviors, our team also looked at associations between drought and child vaccination coverage using DHS data among about 130,000 children from 22 sub-Saharan African countries. And we found that those exposed to drought had lower odds of uptake of four different childhood vaccinations. So BCG, DPT, polio, and measles, a very important pathway towards other infectious disease and morbidity. And a final pathway is violence. And studies have really linked climate change to different forms of violence, including armed conflict. And in fact, interestingly, expert, experts estimate that three to 20% of the conflict risk over the past century may be influenced by climate variability. And what about intimate partner violence? So we also looked at uh, this association using DHS data from 19 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we found that women exposed to severe drought had higher odds of reporting a controlling partner, higher odds of physical violence and sexual violence. And you can see we saw similar but slightly attenuated associations among those experiencing mild and moderate drought, consistent with a, maybe a dose response effect. And finally, um, studies can also show, and this was a systematic review that also showed an association between heat waves, hurricanes, and tsunamis, and experiences of intimate partner violence. So for instance, women in India exposed to tsunamis had twice the odds of intimate partner violence, and American women exposed to Hurricane Katrina had about five to eight times um, as, you know, were five to eight times as likely to experience IPV. And I think I'm going to stop there. We'll get to this in the discussion to talk about some, um, I'll just turn this off. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to transition to Dennis, who is going to talk about um, our, our study and the context of HIV. Okay, so I, I'm going to drill down a little further um, into the literature on extreme weather and HIV related outcomes. And, and I'll share the aims of our climate related projects um, that we've been alluding, alluded to that are, are linked to the idea of cohort collaboration. And this will help set the stage, I think, for the remaining presentations that um, will, among other things, delve into details about the climate data that we'll be leveraging. Um, so given the, like, the geographic overlap of extreme weather and the HIV epidemic that Sherry um, highlighted for us. The impact of extreme weather on populations and infrastructure also really threatens to, to limit the impact of the public health response to the HIV epidemic in the future, and if, if it hasn't already. Um, and as such, it's, it's really essential for us to understand more about the specific areas of vulnerability um, and, and so that the global response to the HIV epidemic can adapt accordingly to help limit some of these negative impacts. There was a recent editorial uh, just from last month in the Lancet HIV about this particular issue um, and specifically focused in, on the effect of climate change on the public health response to the HIV epidemic. And it highlights here that you know, the impacts on HIV programs and, and people with HIV can manifest uh, through things like reduced access to prevention, testing and treatment services, poor adherence to treatment, poor nutrition, and reduced immunity. Um, and a recent frontline AIDS report described some modeling work that predicts an additional 12 to 16 million new HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa alone that uh, will result from climate change under what they call the business as usual scenario, which we always seem to be under when it comes to climate change, um, just to highlight the potential scale of the effects of, of climate change on, on the HIV uh, epidemic. The scale is quite uh, massive. Um, and so Sherry covered a lot of these. It's just a brief summary of what we know um, from, from studies that look at the relationship between extreme weather and HIV-related risk factors and burden. Um, these are largely cross-sectional population representative studies, some of which were led by Sherry and her team, and they found associations um, both between heavy rainfall and drought 
with outcomes such as higher HIV prevalence, more partners, sexual risk, et cetera. And um, another recent study have, has shown a link between food insecurity uh, to a higher risk of HIV infection, recent HIV infection, specifically using data in, in the FIAs. Um, but few studies really have looked at the link between extreme weather and HIV care outcomes. Um, that is until very recently. Adam Tricky, uh, who's with us today, has, has co and colleagues uh, longitudinally examined the association of decreased rainfall during uh, 2014 to 2016 in Southern Africa with subsequent HIV care related outcomes among people on ART. And um, they found an association with um, lower lower levels of rainfall, decreased rainfall with higher all-cause mortality and de detectable viral load, as well as fewer HIV care, care visits. And concluding, um, which we agree with very much, that further research is, is really necessary to understand the mechanism, mechanisms be, behind any causal effects that, that might be operating. Um, so to sum up what we know, then it's most of these studies, um, there, there, there have been studies of extreme weather and HIV outcomes. Um, to date, most of them are from sub-Saharan Africa. Most of the studies have been population-based, but they are also pretty much limited to cross-sectional studies. Um, they've examined both extreme rainfall and drought, and there's really only been one longitudinal study, um, which is the only study to our knowledge that, that examined also HIV care outcomes. Which brings us to the idea of cohort collaboration and the potential role it could play in addressing knowledge gaps and generating useful evidence for, for program planning, uh, as well as intervention development and, and adaptation. In many ways, the idea network is, is really well suited to advance this field. Uh, the first thing is, is, in, in, is the geographic coverage of idea. It's vast. Uh, it includes over 400 participating sites in 44 countries. Uh, the second thing is IDEA is large, with more than 2 million people living with HIV enrolling in HIV care at IDEA participating sites around the world. And uh, third, the IDEA data go back as far as 2004 in many instances. And, and all these factors kind of mean that there will be many, many extreme weather events and a diversity of such events um, occurring in proximity to the IDEA sites and their catchment areas. Um, whose effects that we we can examine on on outcomes. Um, in addition, it's important to explore the role of extreme weather on HIV care outcomes for IDEA alone, um, as we have not really been able to fully explain all of the variation in some of the main outcomes that are most important to us, importance to us, such as mortality and care engagement and loss to follow up. Um, you know, it may be that that climate and seasonal weather patterns and extreme weather like directly or, or and indirectly influence these outcomes. Um, we, we have not yet examined this in the IDEA network. And so there are many opportunities here. And, and much of all of this is what is the motivation for our, our recent proposal to NIH for what we're now calling the Weathering HIV Study. The acronym works. It's right there. I won't read, read it for you, but it actually uh, it, it actually does work. Um, it's an idea-linked R01, as well as an administrative supplement to our Central Idea, Central Africa Idea cohort that's that's focused on advancing research aimed at understanding the influence of extreme weather on HIV care outcomes, hope, hoping to fill some of these, these gaps. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging the many people who are involved in this project, um, some of whom are, are here in the room with us today and whom you'll be hearing from. And... Um, Key to this work, of course, is leveraging climate data on temperature and rainfall. And there are these publicly available data, which we've never really leveraged, that come from weather stations and satellite images that can then be sort of interpolated um, across the globe. And, and th so this amounts to having daily temperature and rainfall data um, with, with five kilometers of resolution that can potentially be linked to IDEA sites and their catchment areas that we can use for, for, um, for, for these kinds of analyses. And this is what we're going to hear more about from, from Frank Davenport soon. Um, we're now in the process of, of combining these HIV cohort data from IDEA on the right with the uh, longitude and latitude information that we have with the daily information on rainfall and temperature in the catchment area uh, of the IDEA clinic. So there's a merge happening here. Um, and ultimately we're able to sort of look at the intersection of extreme weather and HIV care outcomes. Um, 
I'm going to share a little bit about the specific aims of the Weathering HIV R01 grant, as well as the administrative supplement I, I alluded to. Um, I'll go through each one here, um, but the first is to characterize the, the causal associations between extreme weather events and subsequent HIV care outcomes. And for this, we're going to um, lean on quasi-experimental methods, which um, our team and others in the network have, have leveraged uh, quite a bit to understand causal effects of different things like policy changes. Um, on HIV care outcomes. And we will be able to, to look at how these associations might differ between the severity of an extreme weather event and the type of extreme weather event, whether it be drought or heavy rainfall or hurricanes or typhoons and, and so forth. Uh, so for an example hypothesis here is that increasing intensity and duration of exposure to extreme weather events will reduce timely ART initiation, reduce routine viral load monitoring, and, and decrease HIV viral suppression, um, which sort of um, leads me to just highlight some of the outcomes and the things, the things that we're measuring with an idea. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the primary outcomes that we are focusing on are timely ART initiation after enrollment in, in, in care or diagnosis, um, routine viral load monitoring, detectable viral load, um, and, and viral non-suppression as our, our main outcomes. I also want to highlight, and, and we, we are going to try to use what information we have to get at some of these pathways that Sherry alluded to, to understand things about mediators and moderators, um, and a bunch of potential covariates. Um, we, and, and we're going to hear a little bit um, from Andrew about some of the geographic um, uh, data sets that, that might fit into this category. Of course, ideas big and there's a lot of people in it and that enables us to do lots of analyses that are specific to different subgroups. And I'm listing some of them here, you know, people with advanced HIV, people who are newly enrolling in care, which may be a vulnerable time for some people, um, infants, children, adolescents, pregnant women, and, and people who live in rural settings. And the second aim is about trying to elucidate mechanisms of, of potential impact of, of these extreme weather events, as, as well as the things that enhance resilience against the effects of extreme weather. Uh, the, the, this is the sort of mixed methods part of our R01. We're going to be conducting, under Sherry's leadership, some qualitative studies in the Philippines and in Rwanda that will um, talk to patients with HIV, as well as providers to understand um, some things about the, the level of vulnerability, but also how they've, they've coped with, how they've adapted to um, extreme weather events in the past. Um, and then informed by that information, we'll do some more uh, quantitative work that uh, tries to get at the, um, understand the, the extent to which mediators and moderators are, are operating in, in, in some of these asso causal associations. The last aim, which I won't spend too much in time on, but I um, do want to highlight that we we have gone through the process of realizing the challenges of, of leveraging this climate data, and we want to try to save other people from having to go through all the same work that we did. And so we are going to create some public use data sets um, that, that people can use for, for their own work, for their own cohorts. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is the the uh, linked administrative supplement that I alluded to. Um, we we received this um, almost exactly around the same time as the the R01, and I, I'll highlight the aims here because it really is what brings us here to you today at IWAD. We we do want to build scientific interest and collaboration around this kind of work, and we're starting you know we're, we're starting with the idea collaboration. We're building a scientific interest group within the network, but we want to extend it to other people who are working on HIV cohorts and who are interested in, in collaborating. So aim one of, of our supplement is to really build this, this scientific community um, in and around the IDEA network. Um, and we want to publish a paper that sort of describes this process that we've been going through to be able to leverage the climate data in ways that will, you know, get, get us through the whole research agenda that we have outlined for this R01, as well as future research um, projects that, that we might want to do and others may want to do. So this would really outline all the different definitions, the code that we've used to, to leverage the, HF, the, the um, publicly available data on temperature and rainfall, um, et cetera. And um, the aim three is, you know, we, we will like support the initial analyses to help investigators in our network um, 
do prelim generate preliminary data, preliminary analyses that they can use either for new idea concept proposals or for grant proposals. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of touched on this. The, these are our, our goals. We, we're looking for people who are interested in or, and, and who are conducting similar work. Um, we want to share ideas. We want to share data sets and tools and, um, you know, help, help facilitate the identification and prioritizing of research questions that IDEA and other HIV cohorts collaborations are poised to answer. So um, what I'll impart and what we've taken away so far is that merging longitudinal cohort data with daily climate data is challenging, but feasible. And you're going to see uh, some of the results of that work next. Um, it really does help to set, set the stage for our larger research uh, agenda. Um, the, the work ultimately can help identify some of those geographic locations and, and populations where extreme weather events are more likely to lead to bad outcomes and maybe more likely to slow progress towards, um, towards our efforts to end HIV as a public health threat. And um, while we're focused on HIV service utilization and outcomes, this work, uh, we think, has broad relevance for other chronic health conditions requiring you know, continuous access to care and treatment. I'm Frank Davenport. I'm a researcher at the Climate Hazard Center at uh, UC Santa Barbara. And I'm going to give an overview of some of the climate and weather exposure metrics we've been pulling together for this uh, project, as well as a little bit of background on what we call Earth observation products, how we measure, measure precipitation other, uh, and other things. Uh, very quickly, I just want to give you some context on sort of where I'm coming from. Um, I'm part of this, I don't know if you can see it, it's a little bit cut off up there, but the Climate Hazard Center at UC Santa Barbara. Much of the work I'm going to present on Earth observation products comes from a broad group of, of, of a team, so there's us at Santa Barbara. Uh, we also have several field scientists uh, within Central America and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and also Central Asia. And there's a lot of collaboration with the USGS, uh, NASA, USDA, and USAID. Uh, and the reason for this is all the sort of products and research and what we call our, our core funds um, were originally funded by the Famine Early Warning System Network, uh, which is an, a USAID-funded program, although it's a big international uh, group at this point uh, that looks at humanitarian intervention in, in the case of food insecurity uh, and famine. Uh, and many of the the, the, the main product I'm going to present today, CHIRPS, a precipitation product, was developed to support this group, and our products are often used uh, in their outputs. Um, I should also say, um, in my personal experience, I have a lot of experience looking at uh, climate and weather exposure and health outcomes. But this is my first time really digging into HIV. I'm very, very excited, uh, but I do, would ask you to sort of keep in mind when you ask questions and stuff that I may be very unfamiliar with a lot of the acronyms. And I'll return the favor when it comes to the climate products. Um, so let's start with our first acronym, which is Earth Observation Products. Uh, we tend to use that term rather than satellite, uh, because as I will show you, many of these products come while the satellites are the primary source, they may come from airplanes, they may come from drones, they may come from in-situ measurements, and often they may be some modeled combination of those. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of the product that we produce at our group, uh, CHIRPS, uh, look at how we combine EO products with survey data, the typical workflow involved, and then I'll dive deep into sort of the actual products and metrics that we've come up for this uh, product thus far. And then I think a little bit cut off down there, some challenges and opportunities uh, with going forward. Okay, uh, so just a very basic, we're going to have a little kind of one-on-one primer um, on measuring uh, rainfall from space. Uh, there's a variety of different satellites up there. There's sort of two different types uh, we tend to look at or think about. Um, ones, the first are Earth orbiting, and they're sort of following some preset path around the globe and usually do one or two passes around the Earth each day. And then the others are what we call geostationary that remain fixed at the same spot for their entire lifetime and are able to observe the same spot on Earth for both day and night and over different parts of the season. So that second one we just mentioned, uh, those geostationary, that's what we're going to focus on today. And those are typically what we think of when we call weather satellites. Um, and this is for the vast majority of products that we look at and to generate weather and weather forecasts come from these geostationary satellites. Uh, we're going to focus, or our, our products are, are use what's called passive remote sensing. So unlike something like, say, a radar or LIDAR, which sends a signal out and then bounces back and drives data from that, 
We're simply, in this case, measuring, uh, just taking passive measurements, in this case, of the infrared uh, energy spectrum. Um, and I'll go into this a little bit more detail in the next slide, but typically we're looking for cold, high top clouds. We call this cold cloud duration, which is an indication of storm activity from which we can derive the amount of precipitation, um, the duration and the amount of a given event. So just to kind of spell that out <laughs> in, in bold uh, font again, we have a series of satellites that cover the globe, most of the globe, and they routinely record the temperature of their target. If that target is cloudy and the temperature of the cloud is measured, we can then use that to estimate the amount of precipitation. Um, so a little bit of sort of behind the weeds there, we, we call this the geostationary quilt. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have time going back to the start of the satellite era, which is about 1980 to the present. And on the x-axis, we have longitude. Um, and each of these little, little panels here, um, little psychedelic panels here, um, are all different satellites that have been up and had different coverages through time and space. Uh, you will notice that there are, in the earlier part of the record, there are some blank spots. So it was not universal. Those are all mostly around the sort of Himalayas uh, and, and parts of Nepal. Um, so what we do is our, our product, our CHIRPS, our climate hazard infrared precipitation with stations. And I'm going to get to that stations part in a second. Um, we have essentially a sort of a 40-year record of gridded precipitation uh, for the majority of the globe. So why do we use satellites? You know, ideally we might measure this directly from rain gauges and other we uh, um, weather stations, uh, but like any measurement device, those are not perfect. Um, there are less rain gauges out now than there were 20 years ago. There's a, a little bit of a reporting crisis with rain gauges. They tend not to be uniformly distributed. They're also, they're generally located around airports. And like any other measurement device, they are subject to errors associated with precipitation, wind, and especially lack of maintenance. So a big part of our job and a big part of our funding goes to increasing our global coverage of stations. So there are global station networks, but there are also individual and even regional met agencies that we're always sort of um, working with to try to bring in their current and historical data. And of course, we're constantly trying to acquire new station data and clean and validate uh, existing data. Um, so this right here is sort of a, a, a recent snapshot of our, of our coverage. And just each of the blue dots there is a station. You'll notice that it is, it is not uniform across the globe. So that's why we need to have satellites to help fill in that gap. Although as we gather more and more stations, most of our gaps tend to be in very, very dry areas, like say the Australian outback um, or the Sahara Desert. So we combine uh, our station data uh, with, our, with our infrared satellites, and this brings us chirps. And I'll show you sort of how this is made in a second, but just to get you an idea of what this looks like and what the range is, uh, this is the most recent CHIRPS product from February of 2024, uh, and this is showing rainfall anomalies. So observed precipitation difference from the mean. So anywhere where it's gray is roughly around the mean. Anywhere it's red is below the mean and blue is above the mean. All right, I'm going to go into the sausage behind CHIRPS, and then we'll move on to more fun stuff with survey data and what we're doing with, uh, with IDEA. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of sort of how this works. Uh, so we want to think about it in an regression context. You know, we want to start with an estimate of the mean, you know, with our intercept term. Uh, so we have a good historic climatology based, based both on the satellites, stations, and topographic data, which for any given location and day of the year, we can uh, get an estimate of what you would expect. What's the long-term mean for that area? Um, and so then we take uh, our IR, that's the IR in SHRPS, that's the infrared, that's the satellite data I mentioned earlier. Um, and we try to give uh, apply that to for a given uh, day or month, how much precipitation is, is, is falling right then. So essentially, what is our mean and expectation and what's the current observation? But we don't want to lean on satellites entirely. Where we have stations, we want to uh, blend those together. So we essentially do a sort of a, local, a localized, a linear, in some cases, nonlinear regression to blend the chirp with the S to make chirps. We do this in five day increments um, and we finalize the product at the end of each month because there is a bit of a reporting lag for our stations and not all of them come in at the same time. Uh, and we do this for a, a roughly five by five kilometer grid across the globe. Okay. I'm, oh, yes. Yeah. How does pollution factor in or does it to any of these measurements? 
Uh, for cold cloud duration, it, it does not. Um, And then you, it's a monthly average, the output, essentially. It, it's it's month, monthly total. So it's, uh, I mean, we have it down to the, the, the daily level, mm -hmm. but we don't report it until the end of the month because not all the stations report in in real time. The satellites report in, report in roughly half-day increments, but stations sort of come and go. We also have a product called Chirp without the S that you can get a little bit earlier if, if you need really sort of up-to-date real-time monitoring. Okay, so how do we combine EO products with survey data? I'm going to give a brief case study from my own work uh, with demographic and health surveys uh, before jumping in how we're going to do this with, with IDEA. So as you can imagine, you know, we have this, you know, any sort of graded product, it could be precipitation or chirps, um, precipitation or temperature. Um, and we use that um, to match with any survey data that has some sort of location and time stamp to it. Um, so we usually want to know the time or date of an outcome, some health outcome, and then we can match that to the weather expo exposure before, during, and after the outcome. Um, there's a lot of neat things we can do with this. I'll show an example where we can sort of facilitate pseudo-natural experiments, uh, but there are a lot of challenges, and we'll go into this more detail when we talk about the idea data, about really identifying what's that correct spatial and temporal window with which we want to assign our, our weather treatment. Um, so just an example from, from some of my own look, work looking at uh, weather and child health. Uh, specifically, we were looking at, at birth weights um, and height for age Z score, which is a measure of child stunting. Um, and we wanted to know the, 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 the degree to which uh, heat exposure in utero was influencing uh, birth weights. Uh, and this was done with DHS data. I'm not sure if you can see, but each, each of those gray, uh, gray dots is a DHS sampling point. Um, and this was done to support FuseNet. So we were looking specifically at um, sub-Saharan African countries uh, that were of interest to FuseNet. So here's a little cartoon that can kind of illustrate the process. So on the left here, up there is um, um, average, uh, uh, average annual daily maximum temperature uh, for the continent. And then below is some chirps is average annual monthly rainfall. Um, and so over here, you know, I tried to do this laser pointer before and everything went blank. So I'm just going to walk over here and I'm going to not trip on that cord. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I won't do that then. Uh, all right. And I'm going to turn this mic off before I go back over there. Everything is going to be covered. Um, okay. So this right here uh, represents a DHS. Can you hear me? It's turn it on. It's on the bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, we're in business. Okay, so this is a sampling cluster right here, but it could also be an idea location um, or any sort of survey data set that has a, a lat long point associated with it. And then, of course, within that sampling points, you know, we may have multiple households. And then in the case of DHS data, we'll have multiple women uh, with children. So we'll typically take some sort of spatial average. It doesn't have to be the average, but it generally is. Um, in some given radius around that point. And we do this for two reasons. One, we want to sort of have identify the catchment area or the area of effect around which we think the, the weather exposure happened. And two, because we never really want to lean too hard on one given pixel. You know, we need to have a little bit of smoothing, um, a, a little bit of smoothing in that process because this is a, you know, a five by five plumber grid covering, covering the globe and there can, there can be errors in there. All right, and so, I'm going to turn this off now. Yeah. All right. No feedback, no tripping on the cord. All right. So that was the spatial component. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have we want a temporal component. So in this case, you know, we're just looking our, our outcome is just birth and weight at birth. And so we perform the same sort of spatial averaging in the case of, of rainfall for every month prior to the child is born. And in the case of temperature, for every single day prior to, the, uh, to when the child was born. And so we can build sort of a, a life course history of extreme weather exposure um, throughout um, any, any, of our, any of our respondents. And this can be specific to time and location. And then this can allow us to do, you know, these sort of pseudo natural experiments. Uh, so in this case, we kind of filtered our, our data and we looked for women that had exactly two children one that experienced extreme heat in utero during one of the terms and one that did not and simply compared their birth weights. 
Um, and anywhere where it's sort of highlighted, uh, highlighted in black is where the, the child that received the in utero heat treatment ended up having a lower birth weight than his sibling. All right, but we're not really here to discuss that research. I just kind of want to give you an idea of, of what we can do. So now let's move on. Let's talk about idea data and our specific weather and climate metrics and what we've calculated thus far. Uh, so our project to date has sort of focused on rainfall measures. So I'm going to go over uh, three of those. Uh, one measures of heavy rainfall, how much rain hits the ground. Uh, another of floods, what happens after the rain hits the ground, what's the actual impact. And then another looking at severe drought. So uh, we have two products. Uh, this is the first is CHIRPS, uh, the spatial resolu resolution of about uh, 0 0.05 degrees. This is approximately five by five kilometers, but depending on where you are on the globe, that can uh, vary a little bit. Uh, and we have that from 1981 to present, as I said, updated every single month. Uh, the other product we're going to uh, show is the Global Active Archive of Large Flood Events. And these are polygons showing the extent, duration, and severity of recorded floods from 1985 to present. All right, so first is just how much water hits the ground. And we have a couple of different uh, metrics here, and we can discuss these more uh, later on if we like. Uh, but we're looking at both absolute and relative metrics, so just counts of consecutive days of heavy rainfall, specifically exceeding 20 millimeters, and various rolling sums of, of rainfall and rolling three, five, day, three, five and 10-day percentiles and ranks. So we get a good picture of both relative and absolute measures. So what does this look like? And this excellent map that our colleague Andrew put together. Don't know if you can see the continents, but this is the globe. Um, and each of the dots represents an idea site. And this looks at the, uh, the period from 2006 forward and how many of those sites received uh, had two or more consecutive days of rainfall. And that's what the size of the points is measuring. And I don't know if you can see, but I want to call your attention right here to this Lake Victoria region, both because there's a lot of sites right there and there's been a, lo a lot of sort of heavy, heavy days of rainfall there. And that's going to matter when we look at the, the flood data next. So as you're probably aware, uh, heavy rainfall does not always result in floods and you don't necessarily need to have a flood to have some sort of disruption. Um, but in order to get at floods, because it's clear that that, that is a source of, of extreme weather um, uh, disruption, uh, we're looking at the Global Active Archive of Large Flood Events, or GALF. Those of you that are familiar with FloodBase, uh, which is a proprietary product, and there's a screenshot of it right there. Um, this is the same database uh, that flood you, FloodBase uses, uh, but this is the free version. Uh, it's put together by the Boulder Flood Observatory, which used to be the Dartmouth Flood Observatory. But I think when you change jobs, you take your observatory with you. Um, and as I mentioned before, it looks at the start date, the end date. So we have a good kind of temporal timestamp right there. And the number of displaced, the number of dead, and the area of inundation. And the reason why, so if you remember up in the corner there, I had that Lake Victoria region. And then I've got the screenshot from Flood Base on the same region. And we're highlighting the August 2007 floods that occurred there. And this is a fairly substantial event. I don't know if you can see, but about one and a half million people uh, were, dis were displaced. So let's look at how that registers when we aggregate the GALF data up to IDEA sites. Um, so again, if you can see our, our little red box up there sort of highlighting that. And, and what I've done here, and I really only just started exploring this data, is I've averaged uh, the flood-based statistics across all the IDEA regions. So that's what's shown in the columns up there. And then the rows correspond to our different metrics of the number of deaths, the number of displaced, and the duration. And I don't know if you can see it, uh, but the x-axis sort of starts in 2006 and goes forward to 2022. Just to clarify, the number of deaths is from GALF, not from IDEA. Yes, oh, correct, correct. All, all of this is directly is, is coming from flood. So this is, this is all flood-based. I just aggregated, I've looked at IDEA sites to sit within those, those areas of the floods. So you can see right about in 2007 uh, in East Africa, which is in our central, you know, the, the, those heavy rainfall events show up as a large number of people displaced. It, and in the context of everywhere, it was, it was pretty big historically and for having a very long duration. But what's kind of interesting and also somewhat depressing here is we see comparable events, especially in, in Asia Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region and in South Africa and in the Caribbean. So there's a fair amount of interesting variation here 
both um, across time and across these different geographies uh, that we're hoping to examine more in this project. Okay, so now let's move to the other end of the distribution for rainfall, and this is drought. Um, and drought is, there's a bit more agreement. It tends to be a bit easier to sort of determine when there's been a drought than when you have a heavy event, simply because it happens over a larger geographic area and over a long amount of time. Um, our go-to metric there is a standardized precipitation index, and this is simply a z-score of rainfall based on historical distributions. Um, and you typically might calculate it over a monthly time scale, but it could also be over two months, a season, or biannually. Um, the advantage of the drought is uh, within that within that sort of that z score of about you know negative three to positive three, you can uh, rank uh, drought um, drought rankings, so severe drought, extreme drought, exceptional drought on a specific elements. And this is what's typically used uh, in the u s. and European drought monitors. Uh, so again, I'm going to kind of turn to a different example right here. And I, I wanted to highlight Adam Tricky's paper uh, because they've also been been looking at this. Uh, but with my FuseNet hat on recently, we've been uh, paying a lot of attention to Southern Africa. This is from a, a FuseNet and USAID alert uh, that went out uh, just in January, um, where much of the region uh, is at risk of food insecurity. And it's resulting because in what will probably turn out to be one of the worst droughts in 10, if not more years, particularly because of the, the number of dry days we've had in February. So again, let's... Oop, uh, all right, there we go. Let's take a look at what that looks like with respect to idea sites. So in the background here, this is a January and February SPI. So how much rain fell in that two month period relative to what was expected. As you can imagine, red is bad. And a lot of these scores are, are beyond severe. This is really more extreme depth drought. And you know, it's particularly up in Zimbabwe and Zambia where, where it's, been, it's been quite bad. And Zimbabwe is where those fuse net alerts um, are focused. And then the dots are idea sites. And then the size of the dot is looking at from 2006 onward, how many months of severe drought you've had, or th they have had. So these are areas that are both experiencing severe drought right now and have been historically um, exposed to them within, within the study period of idea. Um, so that's what we've done so far. We focused on rainfall, but I wanted to briefly talk about a couple of other measures. Uh, so we have a complementary product uh, called CHIRTS. Um, this is available from 1983 to present. I have an asterisk there because the publicly available version of the data set right now only goes to 2016. However, we have a version and we will be topping that off and updating it monthly soon along with the, the CHIRPS product. Um, and so there's a number of measures of heat stress uh, that we can exploit. I went over a few of them earlier uh, with respect to the, the DHS study. So we typically look at counts of days over a given threshold, such as 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or counts of consecutive days over a given threshold. Uh, and there's also some derived products we can create. One that's very of interest right now within the health and weather communities is wet bulb globe temperature. And this accounts for humidity in wetter regions. And so when you're looking at tropical areas, this tends to be you know, a better measure of actually experience heat stress. So what are we gonna do in terms of next steps? Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more on the challenges. Uh, so we just have these sort of raw measures uh, of drought and extreme and extreme rainfall. I wanna put some kind of what we call spatial and temporal masks. So maybe only look at drought in cropped areas or areas uh, dependent on for livestock or rain fed agriculture and focus a bit more on rainy and growing season. Um, there's also other measures, a very common one that also account for water loss. This is the SPEI, the Standardized Precip Precipitation and Evapotranspiration Index. Those, this accounts for how much water falls on the ground and then how much is lost uh, for evaporation. Uh, and then some contextual data on crop production prices. Um, and there's also other EO measures of productivity. Uh, one is called NDVI or Normalized Differential Vegetation Index, often is a proxy for, for photosynthesis and of course, explore measures of heat stress. So, okay, how are we doing? I think we have about three minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in just under the wire. All right, so there's a couple of challenges. Um, the first one, and this is th this is in any kind of uh, weather and survey data or anytime you link you know, um, weather data and health outcomes is you have to make some, uh, some assumptions about the catchment. So in this case, we're looking at the catchment area of the clinic. You know, that's that's how we get our, our spatial our spatial presence. Uh, 
So we need to, within each clinic, we have to sort of decide what's that buffer region? What's, what's the area of impact uh, that a patient attending that clinic uh, might experience? Um, and this is a challenge, as I'll talk about later. I, I don't think we'll have a one-size-fits-all approach for this. Uh, the easiest is we can get a lot of different buffer sizes, very small and very large, and sort of explore the statistical relationships and how those change, depending on how we expand or shrink the buffer. Or if we look at specific sites or regions, we can get estimates of travel of travel times uh, and, other, and other catchment sizes. The other is a sort of the area of the impact, you know, especially when it comes to drought that may not necessarily be occurring around the clinic. Here again, with my, my kind of food security hat, I have, I have some additional resources to draw on. Uh, there are estimates of crop mass out there. I'm, I'm showing one here from, it's a combined product by IFRI and FAO, and this tends to be the industry standard. And this sort of estimates for each pixel on, on earth, the percent of which is uh, of the area that's cropped. So we can identify sort of prominent growing regions. Um, there's a temporal component there as well. Uh, drought tends to have more seasonal impacts. I, it's more important when it's dry, dry during the rainy season, uh, but we do have access to crop calendars. It's a little bit blurry right here, but here's a crop calendar uh, for Kenya showing planting uh, and harvest times. So we can get a little more precise with our spatial and temporal treatments uh, when we look at drought. Uh, and this is the big one, you know, I said, this is not really going to be a one size fits all approach. You know, I think there's really going to be regionally specific impacts, you know, what a drought or extreme weather event means in a tropical versus temperate environment is quite different, different. Also, what's the livelihood uh, st uh, status around that area? Are we looking at an urban versus rural or a subsistence versus commercial agriculture um, based region? Uh, so as, it, as we've gone forward, I think Ellen will talk about this a bit, we're, we're probably really going to be focusing on regional and or in some cases site-specific analyses. Okay, this is the part where I repeat all the things I just said. Uh, so just to, to go through that, uh, you know, so we've made some preliminary measures of heavy rainfall, flooding, and droughts to idea sites. We've merged the data and we're looking at some of those summary statistics and those are set up for analysis. Um, as is always the case, we want to expand on those metrics, add some more measures, and also refine, especially the spatial and temporal extents with how we define our, our extreme weather treatment. Um, and then add those additional measures I mentioned earlier, such as heat, SPEI, and the contextual data well, with my colleague, Dr. Morocco, will present. And that's it. You know, I'll say that, that's a great, I'm sorry, Dad, I don't mean to step on your toes. That's a it's a fabulous question and totally sets this up. Um, it, it's going to be it's going to be it, not only will it be answered in a second, but we're we're one step closer to more coffee. So everyone should be happy. Uh, so yeah, no, we're going to talk about some contextual variables here. Now, what you brought up is actually extremely important, and one of the reasons we're doing this, or the reason I'm excited about this, is to get as much feedback as possible on what we should include and maybe what's not as important or what's important here and not there. Um, but before we actually totally get into it, uh, this is Frank's data again that he just presented. And so it's, we all know it's very complex to put this together, but it's also complex data in, in reality. So these are our cumulative heavy rain events that he was describing before, shown globally over the idea sites with the, you know, the longer spikes being the, the more heavy rain days. Uh, so you can see there's general trends, general geographic trends, but there's also a lot of very local spatial variability in the rain events, because rain is, is a relatively local thing. It's spatially autocorrelated, but there's a lot of variability. And the other aspect of it, this is working, it is, is, uh, is that it, it's temporally variable as well. This is aggregated by year. So every time the map changes is another year of the data. And at a specific idea site, you can have a year with a lot of heavy rain events and a year with very few. And in neighboring things, they may or may not be correlated. So it, it's, it's complicated data any way you cut it. And keep that in mind as we go through some of the contextual data and some of the challenges that are going to arise around this data. Uh, so the first thing is to kind of answer, like, what do we mean? Basically, anything that's happening around the site, you know, around the idea site, it could be physical environment, like a, a natural or, or built, and it could be social environment. And just as there's variability in climate, there's variability in these data, sometimes much more. Uh, the reason we're interested in them, and I, th I think everyone feels this and it's already been brought up, is that it can mitigate or it's very likely to mitigate or exacerbate the effect of extreme weather on the outcomes that we're interested in, in the end. Uh, 
And it could also help us identify some interventions that are at different scales than either like some global scale changing climate change or very local scale or individual scale. And we have looked at a lot of variables already and, and we're hoping to look at quite a few more, but some include classic things like elevation and slope and land use, infrastructure, urbanicity, and some social characteristics like income or poverty, regional HIV burden, migration patterns, food insecurity, conflict, and a lot of things that Sherry had talked about in earlier this afternoon. So what's gonna follow here is just a few examples, just to show you what some of these look like that we've been looking at. And uh, so this is population density on the left and uh, global human modifications of terrestrial systems. These are both CDEC, which are our NASA products uh, at one kilometer resolution. And what the, the weird name means for the one on the right is basically how much anthropogenic change there's been to the natural environment, which more or less relates to how built up an area is. And if you have really, really good eyes, you'll be able to see um, triangles in South Africa instead of the circles. And those are two sites I picked just because they're relatively close to other, each other uh, in a global scale anyway, and uh, have a lot of variation in the data I'm gonna show you. So here we're zoomed in, one site's in Cape Town and one's in a rural area. In the population density, you can see there's a lot of differences. Right In the urban area, it's higher values and more clustered. In the more rural area, it's, it's more dispersed. And these circles, which hopefully you can kind of see, uh, show these buffers that Frank was talking about before. The largest one is 50 kilometers, and then there's 25 and then 10 kilometers inside. And you can imagine if we were gonna aggregate this data by these buffers, you'll get very different results aggregated in these different ways. Uh, so how we operationalize it uh, are really big questions that we have to explore and answer, and it might not be one size fits all. This is the human modification to the environment. As you would expect, the urban area has much higher values than the more rural area. Uh, th th this is a different data set. Now it's elevation from the shuttle radar topography mission in 2016. Uh, the really nice thing about this is very high spatial resolution as opposed to like the one kilometer from before. This is around 90 meters at the equator. Uh, so it it's nice data. And just looking at this, you can see they're, they're quite different, these sites. But probably what's more interesting in, in these studies are the slopes, so the, um, how quickly the elevation changes over space. Uh, so this, I derive from that elevation data, and you can see again, they're, they're very different, and whatever aggregation we use is gonna result in, again, very different estimates and different ways to operationalize this. If we zoom into the 10 kilometer buffer, the urban site is pretty flat, but the rural site is really quite hilly. So imagine like normally trying to get from one place to another hilly area is trickier. If anyone was in Lisbon earlier, you know that it can be a challenge. Um, and during a heavy rain event, that's even more so, just like uh, uh, Sherry was saying before with the qualitative work. Now we're zoomed in even further. So the, the largest buffer here is two kilometers and the smallest one is half a kilometer, about a five minute walk. So this is a pretty tight window over the sites. And these are just ortho imagery. So just basically a photograph. And besides the obvious differences we can see, you can see the, the roads more or less. And you can see on the urban area, they're mostly paved. And in the rural area, they're mostly unpaved. So you can imagine that, again, during a heavy rain event, this will have really differential, uh, it'll make the event result in different outcomes uh, because of the, the road conditions after, after this event and possibly for a long time after the event. The last thing I want to show is just an economic data set. So it's just an example. Um, this is purchasing power parity, which is, again, from CDAC, which is more or less an estimate of uh, uh, how affordable some basics are to, to live on globally, try to be normalized. And it's, it's interesting data. You can see its distribution. But the reason it's on here is because the spatial resolution of this is 100 kilometers, more or less, at the equator. And if you zoom into those two sites again, you can see each pixel is really large. And each pixel, like Frank was saying, kind of is, is one data point. And that pixel represents that entire area of Earth. So it's it, this different resolution will, if we want to use this data set, will require us to operationalize it in a very different way. So here, if these things are working. You know, I spent a lot of time making these animations, so I want to make sure that... All right, cool. Um, so the, these are the dry event equivalents to the wet event ones I was showing before. So these are drought months, number of months that were drought over this time period, um, cumulative on the top and by year on the bottom. 
So some of the challenges we're facing here are similar to what Frank was saying. How do we decide on this buffer size? Should it be different for urban or rural areas because there's different catchments? Um, should we think about mode of transportation? Should we think about travel time? Or should we use different buffer sizes for different variables because these things could behave at different scales? Uh, we have to think about a harmonized global or at least regional data. So we make sure we're doing apples to apples and not comparing things that are really supposed to be the same thing, but in, in effect aren't. And we have to think about the temporal and spatial resolution for each data set as we go, because there's different requirements for our questions we're trying to answer. And something like elevation might not change that much, but population density may. Uh, so these are all the things we have to think about. And, and I'm really looking forward to getting some feedback from y'all later on where we'll have a lot of time to talk about. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Brazier uh, from the City University of New York. And uh, the aim of this presentation is to talk through some of the challenges in estimating the causal effects of extreme weather and a few of the causal inference methods that we think may be most appropriate given these challenges. And I just wanna acknowledge my colleague, Zach Sean, also of CUNY, um, who has been thinking through these questions with us, but was unable to be here with us today. Um, as Dennis mentioned, through this study, we, we aim to understand how extreme weather influences uh, outcomes along the HIV care continuum, including the timeliness of art initiation, patient engagement and disengagement from care, patient monitoring and viral load suppression. And additionally, we want to better understand the contextual and patient factors that moderate the effects of extreme weather in order to better identify um, pockets of vulnerability that need to be addressed to mitigate the effects of climate change. These include some of the contextual factors that Andrew was just talking about, um, factors such as the natural built and social environments around idea clinics, along with the characteristics of the patients reflected in ideas data. And thirdly, we want to better understand how the effects of extreme weather uh, may be mediated by some of the uh, by the various pathways uh, discussed by Sherry, including factors such as undernutrition, comorbidities, and infectious disease. So this research presents some really important methodological challenges that are worth noting. Um, you know, first, there's the problem of cross-sectional confounding. Uh, for example, uh, low socioeconomic status areas uh, may be historically pr more prone to extreme flooding you know, extreme weather events, droughts and flooding. Um, and those, those areas may be more vulnerable to the health impacts of extreme weather because of factors related to the healthcare access, housing, transportation, sanitation. And there are many possible mechanisms through which the places with higher propensity for extreme weather may be different from those with low propensity for extreme weather. And it will be very difficult to control for all the, these sources of confounding. There may, be all, may also be uh, temporal confounding uh, but um, with trends, uh, uh, changes in, in trends in HIV care, along with economic and social tr factors that coincide with weather related events, the light conflict. Um, you know, there are also you know, policy changes in policy, such as changes in, in treatment guidelines for HIV care or the decentralization of health services may coincide with uh, extreme weather and may confound the associations of interest and, and lead, lead to bias estimates. It's also worth noting that the effects of extreme weather events may be cumulative, um, they may be immediate uh, and transient, or they may be delayed and sustained over time, which presents real challenges for measurement. Um, the exposures of interest and time varying confounders may also have nonlinear associations with our outcomes of interest. Um, for example, uh, this, the impact of variations in temperature or drought may, may vary at different levels of temperature and, and drought. Um, or by the duration, frequency, and severity of these, these events. And as Sherry and Frank mentioned, the effects of extreme weather on HIV care outcomes in one area may be partially driven by weather events in another area. Um, so making it really important to take into account broader contextual factors related to agricultural production, uh, food security, and other socioeconomic events. Um, there are some also some... In, in, interpretational challenges for this work. Um, you know, first is the fact that extreme weather events may have indirect effects on the cl on clinic level outcomes because of changes in the characteristics of the patients who enter care or who remain in care at those clinics. Um, in addition to having direct effects on the care and the disease progression among the patients or uh, who were previously enrolled. 
Weather events may also have countervailing effects. As Sherry mentioned, there's evidence that drought may lead to increases in new HIV infections, but these may be hidden if, if fewer people are accessing health services. And a third challenge is what we consider harvesting effects, namely the acceleration of the occurrence of outcomes among susceptible groups who are already close to having that outcome. Um, you know, for example, some patients may be at greater risk of being lost to the clinic, um, and the the occurrence of the extreme weather event essentially accelerates that that event for the, those patients. And what we might see is a clustering or a sudden increase in loss to clinic uh, among you know immediately at the time of the event, followed by a real reduction in that occurrence later. But it's simply it's not that it's reduced afterwards. It's just that that the population of vulnerable people has been depleted. Um, so in view of these challenges, we've, we've been considering various quasi-experimental approaches, as Dennis mentioned, um, for estimating clinic-specific effects of extreme weather events, and plan to use meta-regression approaches in order to derive pooled estimates for overall effects, as well as for some of the contextual or patient-level uh, factors that we think may be important effect modifiers. Um, these are factors such as, you know, setting, urban, rural, um, other aspects of the, the natural environment and built and social environments, as well as patient characteristics such as age group, uh, sex, pregnancy status, and, and other variables that may be in our idea data. And this is just a plot illustrating, um, so, uh, illustrative from some prior work where we did use uh, meta-regression analysis to estimate pooled effects of the, um, of expanded treatment guidelines across 152 idea clinics in 15 countries. Um, so one of the methods we've been considering is regression discontinuity in time, which uses a calendar time point uh, for categorizing exposure um, with the assumption of exchangeability among patients enrolling immediately before and immediately after that, uh, that calendar time point. Uh, in preliminary analyses, we used somewhat cruder uh, measures of extreme rainfall than the ones that Frank has been, you know, refining more recently. Um, and we use these, these measures uh, to try to estimate changes in rapid art initiation associated with extreme precipitation events across almost 300 idea clinics in 20 countries um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, strata by, by urban and rural settings. Um, and the preliminary work highlighted for us some really important and, and illuminating challenges that we're still grappling with, um, including the appropriateness of a sharp regression discontinuity design which really um, assumes that the calendar time point is, is deterministic in terms of exposure um, rather than probabilistic. And, you know, there, of course, there are extreme weather events like hurricanes um, that have a very clear start date. But, you know, for most of the most extreme weather events and periods of, you know, heavy precipitation or drought, there is no, you know, you, you know, distinct or discrete starting point um, and or or um, that that's available in the climate products we're using. Um, and relatedly, it's worth noting that idea for idea data, we have the location of clinics, but we don't have the location of the residents of, of the patients served or coming to those clinics. Um, and so regardless of the buffer sizes or radiuses we use, you know, to define the catchment areas of these clinics, there's likely to be a lot of variation in terms of people's exposure to those extreme weather events, even within the catchment area. And in, in view of these, these sort of sources of, of uh, uncertainty, you know, an approach like a ref, uh, what's called a fuzzy regression discontinuity design might be more appropriate to, to like accommodate the uncertainty in our exposure data. Um, there's also the possibility, of course, that exchangeability assumptions aren't met if the weather actually affects who enrolls in the clinic. Um, those enrolling in care before an extreme weather event may no longer be a, an appropriate counterfactual for those enrolling during or after the event. Um, and uh, in our initial work, we, we also observed this possibility of what I'll call a forbidden contrast, which is that someone um you know someone who enrolls right before one event of interest you know we would consider them unexposed um at in contrast to those enrolling right after who are exposed but in areas where these um extreme weather events can happen in rapid succession that unexposed per the person unexposed to the second event might have previously been exposed to a you know an event that happened just previously um so these are you know some challenges that we're still thinking through um and 
Difference in differences analysis is another uh, quasi-experimental method that could be applied to address some of our research questions. Um, traditional DID compares changes in outcomes over time between exposed and unexposed groups to estimate the causal uh, effects of a policy change among those who are exposed. Uh, a key assumption in DID has always been a parallel trends assumption, namely that the outcomes among the control group are indicative of the outcomes for the exposed group in the absence of exposure. Um, and this is an assumption that really could be violated given some of the unmeasured uh, cross-sectional and temporal confounding that we may have. Um, that said, there's been a flurry of recent developments in DID that are quite relevant for addressing some of the methodological challenges that we've been thinking about. And these include um, developments that allow for time varying treatment effects, including multiple exposures, um, as well as uh, exposures that are staggered across the treatment group. Um, and there's also been some recent work to develop methods to test for and account for uh, violations of the parallel trends assumption. Um, and thirdly, we're considering G computation methods, which can be used to estimate causal effects by, by essentially simulating counterfactual outcomes under different exposure scenarios. Uh, G computation methods can be used to simultaneously uh, project forward both changes in the um, patient mix as well as changes in the HIV care outcomes under, under these different exposure scenarios. There was a recent analysis using this approach um, to estimate the effects of decreasing neighborhood uh, deprivation on the cumulative risk of STIs among women living with HIV, and where they compared uh, sort of no intervention to affect area deprivation versus interventions that reduced area de deprivation by one or two tertiles. Uh, G computation has also been used to estimate mediated effects and maybe the best approach we have for trying to examine some of the causal mechanisms that Sherry was mentioning. Um, so I'll just wrap up by acknowledging that, you know, each of these approaches has some real limitations and we really plan to take a pluralistic approach and try to triangulate as much as possible. But we also, you know, one of the things we're hoping to do to, today, you know, today and going forward is, is get your thoughts on these and other approaches that might be uh, useful for examining the very complex pathways through which extreme weather may impact HIV care outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Okay. Um, well, I might, again, my name is Pam Murnane. I'm at UCSF and uh, I'm an epidemiologist and I will be talking about um, our, our qualitative work in which we're going to try to understand sort of mechanisms and pathways, uh, ideally to inform adaptation strategies. So our current objectives for our qualitative work are to elucidate pathways through which extreme weather events impact HIV outcomes uh, to identify factors that may modify the health effects, um, including social support or individual level factors and some of the things we've been discussing here already today, um, and to identify promising adaptation strategies. So we're also gonna explore regional differences uh, as our two primary sites are in Rwanda and in the Philippines. Uh, but I'll also, for the second half of this presentation, discuss our proposed administrative supplement to the R01 which we're working on right now, and we wanna extend this work to new populations as well. So in Rwanda, um, drought and rainfall are um, heavily impacting uh, the communities there, and HIV prevalence is uh, about 2.3% in the general population, and ART uh, access is really quite good. Uh, but the graph, so the graph on the left uh, is Incidence, so it goes from 1990 to uh, 2022 on the x-axis and its incidence on the y-axis, and you can see it's going down consistently, mostly uh, in Rwanda. Uh, but in contrast, in the Philippines, it's it's you know massively increasing. So um, although overall prevalence in the Philippines is only 0.3 percent in the general population, it is a concentrated epidemic, primarily among men who have sex with men, and access to ART is suboptimal for sure at 41% in the last estimate. So in our qualitative work, we're going to recruit 25 persons who are living with HIV in each country um, and 15 key informants in each country. And we're gonna do two interviews with the people who are living with HIV because we want to understand some variability in their exposure to climate over time. So we're currently working on our semi-structured interview guide um, in which we want to, um, you know, we're going to be asking open-ended questions, but we really want to understand people's lived experiences. And through this, we hope to 
understand the mechanisms that they perceive are most important uh, that impact that how climate impacts um, their health outcomes in the context of HIV. And I'm just reminding us here of the the pathways that Sherry highlighted, but also with an open ended um, semi structured interview guide, we we may you know we, we're hoping we may find other pathways as well. So we're also going to look for factors that may modify their vulnerability or their resilience to these effects, and ideally to uh, discuss adaptive strategies that have worked for them. Um, or that they they perceive to be potentially effective and feasible. And with um, key informants, um, we're going to ask them about perspectives uh, on the impacts, their general perspectives on, on the people that they represent, the people who are living with HIV that they represent. And uh, what we really want to hear is their narratives about implementation of any adaptation and mitigation strategies that they have already tried, uh, whether it's regionally or at the national level. And any le uh, lessons about um, best practices, barriers, and facilitators. Okay, so I will now transition to our uh, proposed supplement application currently in development. Um, so, you know, the, the regional differences, demographic dis differences, and cultural differences across communities um, likely translate to different pathways uh, and different vulnerabilities to the effects of uh, extreme weather events on HIV outcomes. So we propose adding Western Kenya and pregnant and postpartum women who are living with HIV. Uh, Western Kenya has a very high HIV prevalence in the general population in contrast to Rwanda and the Philippines, and food insecurity is very highly prevalent. And mobility is really a way of life in this community. Uh, and the majority of adults also in this region are small scale farmers, but uh, with the droughts, uh, floods and um, very limited irrigation, uh, there's ongoing and increasing food insecurity in the region. Droughts and floods also contribute, as Sherry has mentioned, to increased mosquito breeding, forced migration. And for people who do rely on mobility for their livelihood, um, it can you know, impact their, their ability to engage in that. So uh, in, in terms of why pregnant and postpartum women, um, women are often responsible for managing meals, managing water in the household, fetching water. Um, yet during pregnancy and early postpartum, their reduced physical capacity can limit their ability to engage in this work. And um, managing food and water can also become extra challenging during extreme weather events. Pregnancy is also associated with depression, with food insecurity, and with gender-based violence. And these associations are even larger among women who are living with HIV. And of course, HIV in pregnancy also bears the additional risk of perinatal transmission and poor infant growth and development. And uh, food and water insecurity are also associated with these outcomes, associated with poor engagement, potential for HIV transmission, and poor nutritional outcomes. So because extreme weather events also impact all of these uh, intermediate outcomes, food insecurity, specifically um, HIV care engagement and gender-based violence, pregnant and postpartum women are really um, a high priority population for adaptation, adaptation strategies. So as a reminder, in the parent R01, we planned uh, 25 interviews in each region uh, among people who are living with HIV and 15 with key informants. So we're gonna do the same in Kenya, but also add an additional five so that we have a total of 30 in both Kenya and Rwanda among persons living with HIV. And then we'll ensure that 10 of those 30 are pregnant or postpartum women. And we'll conduct thematic analyses of these data in parallel with our quantitative analyses. And we'll examine convergence and divergence uh, of the findings um, in our interpretation of these data. And so finally, uh, we're also planning a quantitative assessment of the global idea data that may be available to examine uh, the associations between extreme weather events and health outcomes in pregnant and postpartum women. So as many of you probably know, historically, it's been challenging to collect uh, pregnancy-related data in clinical cohorts that are really uh, primarily designed originally uh, to evaluate HIV care and treatment outcomes. But given the central role of prevention of mother-to-child transmission in the global HIV response, um, we think that some of the idea settings have had the resources to track these data more rigorously than others, and over time that most sites um, are probably improving in, in their capacity to measure some of these indicators. So we um, aim to determine the completeness and the quality of key variables 
by region and over time, such as the maternal out maternal outcomes, which actually many of these maternal outcomes listed here are are collected, but will we know if they're occurring during pregnancy? That's what we're going to assess. Um, and then the uh, missingness or non-missingness of birth outcomes and infant outcomes as well. And so we really hope that this work will establish the largest global cohort of pregnant and postpartum women living with HIV in which we can examine um, health effects of extreme weather events. And that is all.